In the first section of chapter three, we want to formally define what a vector valued function is, and what a space curve is. Now we use these in section 3.0, which is really just how to parameterize various curves in space. And we are using space curves and vector valued functions extensively, but we never actually defined what they are. We do so in this particular section. Now this concept, whether it's in two-dimensional space in the plane or three-dimensional space, has a lot of applications to velocity, acceleration, arc length, and curvature of an object's trajectory. So we want to formally define what we mean by a vector-valued function and what exactly the space curve represents in terms of this vector-valued function. We're going to extend our study of these functions into single variable calculus type operations by starting with the limit of a vector valued function. Now, obviously, when we do this, it's a vector. So how do we do the derivative? We saw a little bit in the previous video how we can take the derivative. We extend that idea by starting here with the limit. These definitions and theorems are going to support the work we do in the rest of this chapter, and in fact, in the entire course. Let me go ahead and share my screen, and we'll start by formally defining what a vector-valued function is. Behind me, you'll see the actual formal definition for a vector-valued function or vector function. It's a function that takes one or more variables and returns a vector. So the range is represented by a set of vectors. So we input one or more variables and the output is a set of vectors. The domain is the set of real numbers or some subset of the real numbers that gets put into the function. And the output or range is the set of vectors. In 2D, we represent it with R of t equal to some f of t in the i hat direction plus g of t in the j hat direction, or we can use the angle bracket notation with f as a function of t and g as a function of t inside. We can also then represent it in three dimensions by adding the third dimension, h of t of k hat, or adding h as a function of t inside the angle brackets. Now, when we do this, this creates component functions, f, g, and h, which are functions of some parameter t. f, g, and h are real valued functions, functions that we're used to from our previous work in calculus one and two. They output real values. You input real values, they output real values. But those real values become the components of a vector. So the output of a vector valued function, R of t, is in fact a set of vectors. We were using these extensively in the work that we did in section 3.0. So what exactly is the space curve that we were producing in section 3.0? In CalPlot 3D, the space curve is what you get at the endpoints of all the vectors in the set of the range of values of a vector valued function. So let's talk a little bit more specifically, and I'll show you a picture that hopefully will make it a little more clear. We're going to start in two-dimensional space. So in two-dimensional space, if we have a vector-valued function, we have real-valued functions, f of t and g of t. f of t is multiplied by i hat and g of t by j hat to produce vectors. And this gives us a set of vectors for the particular function that we have for all the values of the parameter t. So we can almost consider it sort of, well, it's not really an ordered pair. The first is a real value t, the parameter. The second component is the output, which is the vector itself. 
the path that it traces in two dimensions is called a plane curve. In three dimensions, we call it a space curve. So the true output of a vector valued function is a set of vectors, but the endpoints of those vectors trace out a curve that we call a space curve. Let's take a look at these two representations down at the bottom. The one on the left is in two dimensions, a plane curve, and the one on the right is in three dimensions, a space curve. In both of these graphs, you will see what looks like a curve on the left in blue and on the right multicolored with a set of position vectors, standard position vectors starting at the origin and extending to points along those curves. So when we look at the blue plane curve on the left, the position vectors, which are pictured in pink, are the actual output of the vector valued function. The output is actually this set of pink vectors. But by connecting the endpoints of all the position vectors, we trace out what's called a path or plane curve. In three dimensions, it does the same thing. In three dimensions, when we take the set of all the outputs of the vector valued function, and we connect the endpoints of all the position vectors, it traces out a circular path, which we would call a space curve. So the true output are the vectors, but the vectors endpoints, terminal points, trace out a path that we call the space curve or plane curve. Let's take a look now at the first one over here in two dimensions. And you can see again that the output of the actual function are the vectors themselves, but the plane curve is the connection of all the terminal points of the position vectors. Let's now take a look at the domain of a vector valued function. Remember that our f of t, g as a function of t, and h as a function of t are all real valued functions. Where t is a real value that gets input into those three functions, and the output is also a real value. So the domain of the vector valued function is the set of all t values such that f, g, and h are all defined. All three have to be defined or T cannot be allowed in the domain of the vector valued function. Let's talk briefly about graphing vector valued functions. As you can probably guess by now, we don't graph the position vectors. That's really the output of the vector valued function. But what we graph instead is the space curve the connection of all the terminal points of the position vectors, which are the true output. Instead, what we plot is the space curve or the plane curve. In order to sketch the space curve of a vector valued function, all we need to do is substitute different values of t and plot the points in space that correspond to the terminal points of the position vectors that you get out of the vector valued function. Connecting those points creates the space curve. I typically do not expect my students to be able to graph these by hand. I typically expect them to do it using technology such as CalcPlot 3D. Let's take a look at example one. We have a vector valued function and it appears to be in two dimensional space because they are only using i hat and j hat. It's t squared minus 3t in the i hat direction plus 4t plus 1 in the j hat direction. They want us to determine if there are any domain restrictions and to evaluate the output when the input parameter t is 0, 1, and negative 4. Let's go ahead and do that right now. First, when we evaluate whether or not it has any domain restrictions, remember that 
f and g are real valued functions. The default domain is all reals. There's nothing in the components for f and g that would restrict that domain. So the domain is still the set of all real numbers. And that's applying to t. The output for r when t is 0 is going to be, well, you're just going to substitute in 0 in place of t, which is going to give me 0 and 1. And notice that I wrote this in angle brackets, and it looks like it changed colors on me there. So this is the vector 0, 1. The point at the end of that position vector is the one that will show up in the plane curve. I could also write this in unit vector notation as 0 i hat plus 1 j hat. What happens now when r is 1? The parameter is 1. In this case, I'm going to end up with 1 squared minus 3, which gives me a negative 2 and four plus one, which gives me five. So I get negative two, five, which I could rewrite as negative two i hat plus five j hat, right? And then finally, I want to evaluate r when t is two. This time I'm gonna do it in my head. Um, t squared, well, maybe I should write it down. t squared, was it negative two or, oh no, it was negative four. All right, so negative four. So definitely I should write that one down. Negative four squared plus three times negative four becomes the i hat component. Four times negative four plus one becomes the j hat component. So this becomes 16 minus 12 or four comma negative 15. Is that four? Did I do that right? Um, four times negative four. Four, negative four squared is 16. Oh, wait, I messed the sign up on my three. That's a minus. So that becomes a positive. So that would actually be 16 plus 12, which would give me 28 in the I hat direction and negative 15 in the J hat direction. All right. So there are no restrictions on the domain. And what we have done is produce the output of the vector valued function for three values of the parameter. Let's take a look at example two. In example two, we want to determine the domain of the function cosine of t, natural log of four minus t, square root of t plus one. Those are our three components. So it is in three dimensional space. The output will be a position vector in 3D. I want to know what the restrictions on the domain are. So I look for restrictions on the domain of f, g, and h, and then combine them together. It has to work in all three parts to be in the domain of the vector valued function. So I look at the first component, which is x equals cosine of t, where the domain d would be all reals from negative infinity to infinity. Then I look at the second component, which is the natural log of 4 minus t. And remember that natural log will only accept strictly non-negative arguments. In that case, in, in fact, it can't be 0 either, so strictly positive. So this means that the domain has to be all the values such that 4 minus t is greater than 0, which basically means that t is less than four, all right? So I can't use anything that is four or larger, otherwise it becomes negative or zero. So I have a combination of all reals, and now I have a restriction that t is less than four, t is less than four is more restrictive, so that's my current domain. Then I look at the third component, which is z equals the square root of t plus one. For square roots, we know that the radicand, what's under the radical, has to be greater than or equal to one. So t plus one is greater than or equal to zero, t is greater than or equal to negative one. 
This means that t has to be both smaller than four and greater than or equal to negative one. So the combined domain for the entire function is going to be from close negative one to open four. And that would be the domain of this vector valued function. Let's take a look at what this one looks like. We come over here. We can see that we have this interesting curve right here. And it's tracing in this direction from negative one to four. And again, you can take and put it on the left and the position factor in blue will trace it out from t equal negative one to t equal four. Now you may be wondering what these other curves on here are. The black one is the tangent vector and the green one um, is the acceleration vector. If you want to take them off, you can click on the gear symbol and you can come up and tell it not to show the velocity vector or the acceleration vector. And now it will simply trace out the point from small t to large t, okay? Let's go ahead now and move on to our next example. This looks like a vector valued function in three dimensions. The first component is two cosine t. The second component is two sine t. And the third component is z equal to three. What is the domain? Well, cosine of t is domain is all reals. Sine of t, the domain is all reals. So there's no restriction in the z. Z just says I'm three, but that doesn't have any restrictions. So the domain is going to be the set of all real numbers, which you can also write as negative infinity to infinity, right? Now, when you're looking at this one and you're trying to visualize what's happening, if z is always three, then it must be graphed in the plane where z is three. And when you look at it, then you take that out and you look at two cosine t, two sine t, which you should remember from section 3.0 is the parameterization of a circle of radius two centered at, in this case, zero, zero, three. And when you look at it, you can see that that's exactly what we have here in the image of it. And we can take a look at it out here in Calplot 3 d as well. And if I want to take off um, the velocity and acceleration vector, I can click those off. And now I just see the position vector and I can trace it from zero to two pi. And you can see it traces all the way around, right? And you can see various views of it here, right? Okay, and it is, of course, a circle. And I plotted the center of it, zero, zero, three. Now, we drew the space curve in 3D as if that was the image or the output of the vector valued function. But make sure you remember that, in fact, it is not. The space curve is the connection of the terminal points of all the output vectors to the vector valued function. The vector valued function outputs position vectors in standard position. And when you connect their terminal points, that's the space curve that you produce. Let's take a look now at the next one. This one is a little bit different than the previous one. It starts out looking somewhat similar. You see that you've got a two cosine t and six sine of t, which you should remember is the parameterization of an ellipse. And it looks like it's in the yz plane, except the problem is that the parameter representation for the x component is negative two t. So if it were negative two, then it would indeed be an ellipse in the plane where x was negative two, but the t is going to change things a little bit. So the first thing that I did was I went ahead and plotted what the two cosine t, six sine of t would look like in the yz plane. So if you plot it in the yz plane, you get something like this, but of course, x equal to negative two t, instead looks like a line. So in a sense, we have an ellipse and a line, 
So we're pulling the ellipse along a line. Can you visualize what that might look like? Think of a slinky. When you do that, what you're getting is an elliptical helix shape. So if I rotate it to show the YZ plane, you can see the different ellipses of different sizes here. And then um, when you're looking at it in a three-dimensional view, it is a helix of various, um, well, kind of going out like a slinky. So let's take a look at what that one looks like now. So you can see it right here. So in fact, I believe all of the ellipses are the same size. They look different because of the three-dimensional um, plotting capabilities of CalcPlot 3D, but they are in fact the same one, just being drawn along some line, right? And the line is given, being given by X equal to negative 2T, right? Let's take a look at another example. We have a vector valued function in two dimensions, so it produces a plane curve, but we could graph it in 3D by setting the Z to be equal to zero. This one gives us a curve that you can see right here, and you'll notice that I added orientation arrows. So if you're wondering how you get orientation arrows, those show up on the plot. So when you're looking right here below number of steps, it says orientation arrows. And if you change that from one number to another, then you will get a different number of orientation arrows. What that means is it's showing the direction of motion from smallest T value to largest T value. And so it's showing the graph of it there. You could also view it in three-dimensional space. It would look like this. It's kind of right there. You can see it's in the XY plane and that will give you the graph of it. Right. Let's now extend what we've done with vector valued functions and their related space curves. And let's start some calculus with these vector valued functions. Just as we did in calculus one, we will start with the limit of the vector valued function. We have a formal definition and we have an informal way of doing it, just as we did with limits often in calculus one. The formal definition was the epsilon delta definition, but we had several methods of actually computing limits. And you'll see the same thing applies here. The formal rigorous definition of a limit of a vector valued function says a vector valued function R approaches the limit L, and notice L is a vector, as the parameter T, which is a real number, approaches the real number A. And we write the limit as T approaches A of R of T equals L, provided that the limit as T approaches A of the magnitude of R of T minus L is zero. In other words, if I subtract those two vectors, one from the other, the magnitude of the result is equal to zero, all right, approaches zero. And again, L is a vector because the output of the vector valued function is a vector. Now, this is the rigorous definition, which we don't often actually use in daily practice. So how do we normally compute the limit? To compute the limit, let's suppose that we have one in two dimensions or three dimensions. I have both of them up here. If we let f, g, and h be functions of t, so t is a real number, and f as a function of t, g as a function of t, and h as a function of t, those are all real valued functions. Then the limit of the vector valued function, which has those functions as its components, is given by taking the limit of f of t, the limit of g of t, and the limit of h of t as t approaches a, and using the limit values as the components of the output vector. So this is only provided, of course, that the limits exist. 
If the limits do not exist, even one of the component limits does not exist, then the overall limit does not exist. Let's take an example and see how this applies. We have a very complicated vector valued function here. The i hat component is the square root of t squared minus 3t minus 1. The j hat component is 4t plus 3. And the k hat component is the sine of the quantity t plus 1 quantity times pi over 2. Now, if we look at this, we want the limit of this vector valued function as the parameter t approaches negative 2. So the limit is itself going to output a vector. So I can write this limit of r of t as a vector where each component is the limit of the real valued function. So I'm taking the limit of t squared minus 3t minus 1 as t approaches negative 2, the limit as t approaches negative 2 of 4t plus 3, and the limit as t approaches negative 2 of the sine of the quantity t plus 1 times pi over 2. And then I evaluate each of those three limits. Now, the easiest way to evaluate a limit is just to substitute the value in and see if you get an answer. So if I substitute negative 2 into the first one, I get 4 plus 6 minus 1, which would give me the square root of 9. And so substituting that in, I get the limit, well, I've already done the limit since I substituted it in. I get the square root of 9, which will give me 3. And for the second one, when I substitute negative 2 in place of t, I get negative 8 plus 3, which gives me negative 5. So that's the second component. And the third one, when I substitute negative 2 into place of t, I get negative 2 plus 1, which is a negative 1. So I have the sine of a negative pi over 2. And the sine of a negative pi over 2 is a negative 1. So my final output vector, the value of the limit, is itself a vector, is 3, negative 5, 1. And hopefully I'm checking real fast to make sure that I did that correctly. 3, negative 5, negative 1. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Now let's go ahead and talk about continuity. You know that after we talked about limits in Calculus 1, we talked about continuity. So many of our theorems in mathematics depend on a function being continuous because it starts, let f be a continuous function, then blah, blah, blah. So if it's not a continuous function, we can't even get started. Well, the same thing applies in multivariable calculus. We need to know when it's continuous. It turns out that the definition for continuity in two dimensions or three is essentially the same definition that we had in calculus one, the formal definition. In this case, f, g, and h are real valued functions of the real number t. The vector valued function, r of t, will be continuous at the point t equals a, provided that r of a exists. In other words, in calculus one, the point exists. In calculus three, the vector exists. If the limit as t approaches a of the vector valued function r of t exists, again, very similar to what we saw in calculus one, that the two-sided limit has to exist. So the point has to exist, the two-sided limit has to exist, and for it to be continuous, to draw it without picking up the pen, they have to be equal to each other. And that is the third component, that the limit as t approaches a of the vector valued function r of t has to equal r of a. And we have the same definition in three dimensions. It's exactly the same. 
This is the end of the section on 3.1 on vector valued functions and space curves. I hope that you'll join me for the next video. In the next video, we'll be taking a deeper look at performing calculus operations with vector valued functions. See you soon.